Before I begin, I just want to say that what we're trying to learn are generalities. We're going to learn the rules and not the exceptions. As you go through uh, the video, uh, there will absolutely be different times when you're going to say, hey, what about this disease? How about that disease? Sure. Uh, there are always exceptions and you know, uh, th th that's what you learn during your uh, residency and beyond. But where you guys are starting out, you want to learn the general rules. And then you can build on and learn the exceptions. Today we'll talk about the neuro axis what it is, why it's important, and why you have to learn all aspects of the neuroaxis to uh, be proficient in clinical neurology. Now, this framework of the neuroaxis is my way of simplifying clinical neurology. When you see a patient, it is very, very difficult to uh, narrow down whether the uh, problem may be in the muscle or spinal cord or nerve um, if you don't have a clear, simple framework. This is extremely important, especially when you're first starting out. Now, obviously, once you're you know, into clinical neurology, whether you're uh, an advanced student or a, a neurology intern or resident, you may not need this framework. But uh, when you're starting out, if you put every single patient through what I call the neuroaxis filter, seeing patients, evaluating patients, and ultimately diagnosing patients become much easier. To help you guys understand the neuroaxis, I'm going to be trying to simplify each level of the neuroaxis into a few simple signs and symptoms, which are the hallmarks of each of these levels. What I need you guys to do is basically memorize these hallmark signs and symptoms. Okay, let's begin. So from proximal to distal. So the neuroaxis is the cortex, subcortex, brainstem, spinal cord, nerve root, nerve, neuromuscular junction, and muscle. These eight levels must be memorized. I can't say that enough. Memorize these eight levels, and now let's start talking about the hallmark signs and symptoms of each of these levels. From a learning standpoint, I will not simply give you these hallmark signs and symptoms. What I want you to do now is to open the books and start reading about each of these levels. On part two of this series, we will discuss muscle. What is a muscle disorder called? What are the hallmark signs and symptoms of a muscle disorder? What are the prototypical diseases that we can think about when we think about muscle disorders? These and other questions will be discussed and answered in part two of the series.